We continue to be so thankful that you have tuned in once again to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church uh, of Memphis Incorporated, our YouTube channel. And we pray that your time will be well spent and prove to be a blessing to your life. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come now uh, again depending on you to give the increase so that we can understand what you're saying to us through your word. We ask that you would help us to apply what you're saying at the appropriate time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're studying from uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 20 through 21. And uh, as I stated last week and previous weeks, uh, we started out reading verse 14 through 23. But for the sake of timeliness, um, probably you've got it memorized by now. We just cut it short and read 20 through 23. Mark chapter 7, verse 20 reads, uh, And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride that we covered last week, and this week, foolishness. All of these things uh, come from within, and they defile a man. In other words, all of these things come out of our hearts and they make us filthy in God's sight. Now, we are using a method of, in our studies called the systematic theology, which is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about any given topic? And thus, we this week we are looking at foolishness and from the way my study is going, we might be on foolishness for a few weeks at least. Now, foolishness is the quality of being foolish, a foolish practice. It's irrash irrational behavior. Uh, in other words, doing things that just don't make sense. Foolishness is when we are unable to rationalize God and his act towards mankind as it is taught in his word. It seems irrational to believe in someone that you can't see. Without faith, it's irrational to believe that there is someone that simply spoke the world into existence. The sun, which is only hid by clouds for a time, was placed there by an invisible, all-knowing, all-powerful, and omnipresent being. That's an irrational belief. And at the top of it all, it's irrational to believe that a, that word can become flesh and and, 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 and dwell among us and die a sinner's death on a cross, that's too many foolishness. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I need to settle down. I'm getting excited too, uh, too much to start with. The Living Bible version of that same verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, says, I know very well how foolish it sounds to those who are lost. When they hear that Jesus died to save them, that sounds foolish. But we who are saved recognize this message as the very power of God. Now, now the message of the cross is all about atonement. 
Atonement is the act by which God restores a relationship of harmony and unity between himself and human beings. The word atonement can be broken into three parts which express this great truth in simple but profound terms. At one meant. Atonement. At one meant. Through God's atoning grace and forgiveness, we are reinstated to a relationship of at one meant with God in spite of our sins. Now, as we look at atonement, we're going to look at two things. Hopefully we get two things covered tonight. And the first one is the human need. The, the, the human need. Because of Adam's sin and our own personal sin, no person is worthy of a relationship with the holy God. Now let's look at a few verses that, that, that makes that biblical. First of all, because of Adam's sin, first, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Romans chapter Five, verse 18 says and let me switch versions let's get let's go with the uh, King James version it said therefore by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation even by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life so through Adam Death was introduced and uh, uh, through, throughout uh, mankind, but then through Jesus Christ, life was made available. And First Corinthians fifteen and and twenty two says, "For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ Jesus shall all be made alive." Now, now, our own personal relationship is spoken of in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil, were against God. So no person is worthy of a relationship with the Holy God. Ecclesiastes 7 and 20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So since we are helpless to co correct the situation, as stated in Proverbs 20 and uh, nines, who can say I have made my heart pure? I'm clean from my sins. Who can say that? None of us. So we needed someone to atone for our sins, to pay the price for our sins. So neither can any of us correct our situation and can do nothing to hide our sins from God. Hebrews 4 and 13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I got to settle down again. I'm getting too excited. We all stand condemned by sin. Romans 3 and 19 says, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth must be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. 
It is human nature, our sinfulness, and God's nature, his holy wrath against sin, which makes us enemies. Romans 5 and 10 says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So, so, so what I tried to do in a few verses there was establish the human need. Now let's look at God's gift, atonement, God's gift of atonement. God's gracious response to the helplessness of his people, especially the nation of Israel, was to give them a means of reconciliation through the atonement of the covenant of the law. Now let's look at reconciliation a little bit to understand atonement better. Reconciliation is the process by which God and man are brought together again, reconciled. We hear that term when, 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 when husband and wives are uh, uh, separated and, and then they are reconciled to each other. The Bible teaches that God and man are alienated one uh another because of God's holiness and man's sinfulness. So it's God's holiness and man's sinfulness that keeps us apart. Our sin separates us from God. And it is only when after Jesus, which has already uh, dealt with uh, uh, the penalty of sin, through justification, through his salvific act on Calvary, and from, from uh, uh, Calvary through the return of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is working on sanctifying us, setting us apart, in, in, in other words, dealing with bringing us out from under the power of sin. It's an ongoing process. And then when the Holy Spirit is finished with us, then Christ will return and then we will be glorified with him. We will be together with him again. That's glorification. I kind of got sidetracked a little bit. Although God loves the sinner, as stated in Romans 5 and 8, but God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is impossible for him not to judge sin, as stated in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27, but therefore, in biblical reconciliation, both parties are affected. Through the sacrifice of Christ, man's sin is atoned and God's wrath is appeased. And therefore, a relationship of hostility and alienation is changed into one of peace and fellowship. Now, if, 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 if the act of reconciliation, if Jesus can reconcile us to God, What's going on in our society today that makes it so difficult for us to be unified, to be reconciled? Well, perhaps it's because sin in the lives of so many continues to prevail. Let me finish. Let me continue. The initiative in reconciliation was taken by God while we were still sinners or enemies of his. Christ died for us. Reconcilia re reconciliation, mm, reconciliation 
is therefore God's own completed act. Something that takes place before human actions such as confession or repentance or restitution. God himself has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus. Paul regarded the gospel as the word of reconciliation. And knowing the terror of the Lord, Paul pleads with and implores and persuades men to be reconciled to God. And, and we should do all that we can to plead, to persuade, to implore men and women, boys and girls, to be reconciled to God. One of the best ways that we can do that is to live reconciled lives before them. Okay. Reconciliation came in the sacrificial system where the death or blood of animals were accepted by God as a substitute for the death, which the sinner deserved. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given to you upon an altar to make atonements for your soul. In other words, God gave mankind an opportunity by using the blood of animals to, 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 to atone for their sins upon the altar to atone for their souls. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. The law required that the sacrificial victim must be free of defects. And the buying of animals always involves some cost to the sinner. So atonement should always involve a cost to sinners. But an animal's death did not automatically make people right with God in some sense or some mechanical way. The hostility between God and man because of sin is a personal matter. And God, for his part, personally gave the means of atonement in the sacrificial system. And men and women, for their part, personally are expected to recognize the seriousness of their sins. We must also identify ourselves personally with the victim that died. In other words, we must identify ourselves with Christ Jesus who died in our place. How can we do that? I'm glad you asked. Through baptism. Just as Christ died and was buried and rose from the dead, Baptism is symbolic of a believer dying and coming alive, being new creatures in Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament, God himself brought about atonement by graciously providing the appointed sacrifice. And the priest represented him in the atonement ritual. And the sinner received the benefit of being reconciled to God in forgiveness and harmony. Although the Old Testament believers were truly forgiven 
and receive genuine atonement through the animal sacrifice, the New Testament clearly states that during the Old Testament period, God's justice was not served. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Hebrews 10 and 14, 10 and chap, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Atonement was possible because of his forbearance. God had passed over the sins that were previously committed by sinners. Romans 3 and 25 says, whom God put forward as a perpetuation by his blood to be received by faith, that was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Now, however, God's justice was served in the death of Jesus Christ as a substitute who, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once and for all. He did it. He died once. He paid the price once for all of us. And not only for all of us, but for all times. That's why it's so important to, for we as followers of Jesus Christ to know that we, that once saved, always saved. I wish I had more time. I would really go into that. And this is the reason he is the mediator of the new covenant. Now, let's look at our response. Uh, let's pause for a second. I tell you what, we'll continue next week with our response. Well, it's not all that much. Do you mind if I kind of rush through it? Our response to God's atonement. The Lord Jesus came in accordance to God's will to give his life a ransom for many or for all. Though God laid on him the iniquities of us all, as stated in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it reads, All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own ways, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. Also, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He became what we were so that we could become what he is. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That's Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 13. Yet, Christ has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God so that those who believe in him might receive atonement and be saved from God's wrath through the precious blood of Christ Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 said, But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemishes or spots. 
No believer who truly understands the awesome holiness of God's wrath and the terrible hopelessness that comes from personal sins can fail to be overwhelmed by the deep love of Jesus for each of us. And the wonder of God's gracious gift of eternal atonement through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus, God will present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Kind of the benedictus or benediction for that we use a lot of times at Mount Sinai. It says, now unto him that is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Let us all say amen. And that's it for tonight, so let's pray and, and I'll, I'll leave you alone. Our Heavenly Father, help us to see your word as the source of our faith. For Romans 10 tells us that faith comes by hearing and our believing your word and acting upon it daily. Help us to please you as we believe what to some may seem like foolishness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you got something out of the lesson tonight on atonement, uh, the foolishness of the cross. Uh, uh, you probably was looking for something on our part of being foolish creatures and it coming out of our heart. But in essence, that's as foolish as we can get not to trust God, not to believe God's word. So we're going to go in depth in that for a few weeks. So I hope you'll continue to join us. Be safe, love on somebody, and remember that the life you save by practicing uh, social distancing, wearing masks, the life you save could be your own. I love you, God loves you, and we'll see you next week, the Lord's will. Bye-bye.